Coming up on CMI, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has achieved success playing hoops, writing books, and even in the movies. Now, the six-time MVP sits down with Chris Myers and reveals the one starring role that's eluded his grasp. Would you like to become a head coach in the NBA someday? I've had, I've had dreams about it. The Hall of Famer also names the best player of all time, explains what's keeping LeBron James from greatness, and admits why the skyhook has been grounded in the NBA. I don't think it's sexy enough for the younger generation. They see themselves as playing the game like Michael Jordan or Dr. J, and I, I don't blame them one bit. Find out how this old school icon plans to educate the next generation in more ways than one. Right now on CMI, the Chris Myers interview. Thanks for joining us. A pleasure to be talking with uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Nice to see you again. Nice to be here, Chris. You look uh, healthy, uh, relaxed, and, and you know, it's interesting. Uh, there are so many sides to you. Jazz fan, father, coach, author, of course, Hall of Famer. Uh, which, are you, uh, which are you most comfortable with? That's too difficult to answer. <laughs> uh, all, all of those are facets of my life, and I'm, I'm enjoying my life. So I, I'd say they are, they're all very relevant. Does it, does it seem like, uh, you know, a lifetime ago? I guess you've been away from the game almost two decades. Um, is that you feel like it, like it was a different person back then that we saw on the floor? It doesn't seem like a different person, but it does seem like a long time ago. <laughs> the fact that I ha hold a certain stature in the game makes me always connected to it. So it's something I, I can't escape. It's, it's always right there. Hall of Fame. I'm still a leading scorer. So all of those uh, aspects of it really come into play. How about wh what are you most proud of in terms of the basketball accomplishments? Personally, being the MVP for six times, that was very special for me because being the MVP is about what you mean to your team. It's not about all, all of your individual achievements. It's about how you help the team cohesion and success. That's how Coach Wooden taught me to play, and uh, I, I took it to heart and, and made it work, work for my team. And a lot of basketball I'd like to discuss with you, but uh, you know, the last time we actually sat down for a lengthy interview was a, over a book. Uh, but your most recent book, uh, tell us about, uh, and even the title I think is kind of catchy. On the Shoulders of Giants. And it's about the Harlem Renaissance, how it affected my life and what it meant to me, what it, how it helped me to become me, and a little bit about what it me meant to America. Now Harlem, when people hear Harlem, they have their own view, those who maybe haven't experienced it. Uh, especially back when you were there or you were growing up. So, so what, if they read the book, what will they, they get a better feel? They'll get an understanding of what created Harlem. Just all the events that came into play, the fact that there were no jobs in the South and there was a lot of oppression and difficult times for, for black Americans in the South and something that they wanted to escape to actually really pursue the American dream. In the North, they found that uh, being away from the Jim Crow laws and away from the, the, the oppression of the South really gave them the opportunity to shine and there was a flowering of, of black culture. Harlem, why was that spot the place? Or were there other spots but that? There probably were other spots. Chicago probably had its own aspect of it, but Harlem got the, the front row seat, I think, because Harlem was in the nation's media capital. And most of the prominent musicians and other like literary figures, people of, of that nature, all gravitated to, to Harlem, and it, it just uh, took off. And, and so where did, where did the sports, uh, the jazz, the jazz I mean, where, how did that figure in? Well, the jazz was always there. It was part of black culture, but in Harlem it had a, a showcase. The Cotton Club, for example, right. uh, featured, Duke Ellington was the, was the house band, and that, that's pretty good. Louis Armstrong, though performed in Harlem, Cab Calloway, uh, Fats Waller. And in addition to that, there was a, a, a great deal of, of literary. So poetry and writing going on that wasn't? Langston Hughes, okay. uh, County Cullen, um, uh, Claude McKay. You had political activism as exemplified by Marcus Garvey. It was an extraordinary time. And, and, and Cab Calloway, it, true that he could have, he made the Harlem Globetrotters, could have gone in, uh, that route? 1928 Cab Calloway was 
21 years old. He tried out for the Harlem Globetrotters and made the team. <laughs> they wanted him to, to travel with the team. He had to choose between traveling with his sister's band, which became his band, or traveling with the Globetrotters. And he went with the entertainment aspect of it. If you'd had that choice, maybe yourself, a basketball or a jazz career, do you think you would have chosen differently? Well, if I if I had had the skills of, of Bud Powell, I, I certainly would have had a, <laughs> a, a, a dilemma there. But since I didn't have those musical skills, uh, basketball loomed, as they say. And those skills were pretty good. Uh, you ever just wonder uh, if you were raised in the South, maybe, at that time, instead of Harlem, how things might have been different for you? I don't want to think about it. Yeah. It was pretty bad times when I was growing up. I remember seeing the picture of Emmett Till's uh, corpse. It, was, it's, it, it will haunt me for the rest of my life. It was some very ugly times. I'm glad I didn't have to deal with that. What do you enjoy most about books and writing them? Well, I enjoy the fact that sharing knowledge is certainly something that's incumbent on every generation. I don't think that in the black community, the knowledge has been passed from generation to generation because of any number of factors. So I, I try to affect that, that dynamic and, and put my, my books out there and, and point certain things out so that succeeding generations can, can see what I saw and, and learn from what I learned. All right, we'll continue with uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the uh, Hall of Famer. We will talk uh, some basketball, go back uh, to those John Wooden UCLA days and understand more why Jackie Robinson is uh, his sports hero when we continue on CMR. Also coming up. We all remember the, the scene in Airplane. How often do people recall, connect you with that? Just last week, I, I had to fly and the pilot came out and said, hey, you, you want to take this plane to LA? And I'm like, really? In, in <laughs> Europe. The pilots came and got me and had me come and sit in the cockpit. They strapped me in. The plane took off and I flew the first two hours in the cockpit. Plus. Why do you think you, you didn't get a chance to coach earlier after your playing days? People didn't think I could communicate. Yes, you were aloof, right? Or I was aloof. I didn't know how to talk to people. And that, that worked against me. That's next on the Chris Myers Interview with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You're watching CMI, the Chris Myers Interview. This is the green. Come on down here, big fella. Put in the chair. The crowd stands for Kareem to get the ball. Everybody's waving their arms. It's in the Kareem. Kareem swing left, right hand, 12 footer. Got it. We're talking with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and uh, and obviously Jackie Robinson is a hero for many. Uh, but for someone like yourself. Uh, an icon, a hero beyond the world of, of sports. Uh, give us your first view of Jackie Robinson and how it influenced your life. My first conception of Jackie Robinson had to do with him playing for the Dodgers. I would listen to the games with my mother on the radio. And I was just a big baseball fan. I, I loved baseball and I, Jackie Robinson was, was my hero. Was it, was it not until later that you understood the significance maybe of what he went through in breaking the color barrier and what, what oh, he was up against? It, it took a while for me to understand that. And then I realized some of the other things he did, like during World War II. I, I, I've okay. written a book about the 761st Tank Battalion, and Jackie Robinson was their morale officer. And he would have fought in combat in World War II if he had gone to Europe with them, but he got into the incident in Texas where he wouldn't sit in the back of the bus and they court-martialed him. And because he was dealing with the court-martial, he couldn't go overseas when they got shipped overseas. He beat the court-martial charges and decided that he had had enough of the Army. And I think uh, it proves a little bit about Providence because I think the good Lord was saving him to do some other important things. And even a perspective, for example, the, the book or going on an Indian reservation, spending a year and, and, and writing about that. And what, what prompted that for you, that experience? Well, I, I just happened to make friends with the people at the White Mountain Apache Reservation. I, I went up there to do some research for the Black Profiles and Courage book. Made friends with them and they, they had certain issues about trying to get the kids to go to school. And I learned in my interactions with them that they have the same problems that they have in the inner city. It, it could be a black neighborhood or a Hispanic neighborhood in East LA where there's lack of educational opportunities, crime, 
and they said that uh, since I wanted to coach, maybe I could start my coaching career there. <laughs> and in, in, in doing that, talk to, the, talk to the kids about going to college and making a difference in their communities. Well, uh, why do you think you, you didn't get a chance to coach earlier after your playing days? I think I, 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 re I was 42 when I retired. And most, co excuse me, most coaches start somewhere in their 20s or 30s. They start at low levels and they go on from there. And uh, I was 42. I took another couple of years off just to deal with the burnout. You have a 20-year professional career. You, get, you have to deal with some burnout. You know, Pat, Pat Riley will wear on you. <laughs> so, he wears out himself as about to yeah, this day. He's we burned can't. himself out. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, was, uh, it was difficult. And then at, at the same time, my relationship with the press was such that people didn't think I could communicate or that I... Because you were aloof, right? I was were... aloof. I didn't know how to talk to people. And that, that worked against me. So there was a number of factors. So, so you don't agree that you're uh, aloof, that you were... Were you that way? Did you change? No, I, I wasn't that way, but I, I didn't get into the whole interaction between the, the press and the players in a way that uh, uh, engendered any goodwill between me and the press, so they chose to see me a certain way. And uh, that's something y you can't have going for you. You have to have the ability to, to talk to all of the people who interface with the game. I since have had head coaching experience and understand what that means. It, it can't, became very clear, but at the time I, I didn't understand it, and it, it took a while for me to learn what was going on. Would you like to become a head coach in the NBA someday? I've had dreams about it, but I'm very happy doing what I'm doing now. I, I have a really great kid to work with in, in Andrew Bynum. Yes, with the Lakers. He's a big guy. Yeah, and uh, he's learning from me. Have you showed him the sky hook? Yes, I have, but he's so far has been very reluctant to use it. Why, why it seems, and I've talked with you before about this, why other people haven't at least tried it and worked at it like you did? I don't think it's sexy enough for the younger generation. <laughs> really? That, that, that's probably what it's all about. They, they see themselves as playing the game like Michael Jordan or Dr. J. And that's very spectacular, and I, I don't blame them one bit. I remember when you couldn't dunk the ball, right? That was against the rules. I mean, now that's all guys want to do. Right, that's all they want to do is dunk the ball and shoot a three-pointer. So it, it all depends. It's, it's an element of style and a generational thing. Where, uh, you ever, uh, the Skyhook, uh, did you develop that on your own? Was it out of necessity? Was it when I was in the fifth grade, some of the kids in my neighborhood uh, where I went to school would work with some of the, the kids that went to college, they, they would work with us. And because I was always the tallest kid in my class, they said, hey, you might be a center. So they showed me the George Mikan drill, which was a drill where you shoot the, the hook shot with, with either hand right in front of the basket. And it works on your timing, your footwork, and your touch with either hand. So I started doing that drill when I was in the fifth grade. And by the time I got into high school, it was second nature, and I had it down. So it's safe to say you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be the NBA's all-time scorer if you didn't have the sky hook. Certainly not. Because yeah. I, I wasn't going to go and make it as... Um, how, how would I say it? I wasn't a bruiser, that's for sure. <laughs> okay. Everybody expected me to be a, a bruiser. If you're going to play the center, you have to be a bruiser. And uh, I had a tool that enabled me to do it using quickness and shot-making ability and agility and speed up and down the court. We all remember the, the scene in Airplane. I think you were Roger Murdoch, right, with the little kid coming up. And how, how often do people recall, connect you with that, maybe before they would? Well, you know, I, flying on a plane, just... Last week, I, I had to fly, and the pilot came out and said, hey, you, you want to take this plane to L.A.? And I'm like, come on. Now. Oh, really? <laughs> Lufthansa. <laughs> really? In, in <laughs> Europe. In Europe. Other the country. Pilot. Really? You want, you want to come it. and fly? We're That's going to Stuttgart. Funny. We flew in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. The pilots came and got me and had me come and sit in the cockpit. They strapped me in. They said, you're going to fly with us in the cockpit. Wow. That's funny. And the plane took off, and I flew the first two hours in the cockpit and talked to them. Well, that's great. It's, it's amazing. But See, I think everybody in the airline industry watches that. Watches that, and, yes. And <laughs> so that they can relax. And, and so. All right, we'll continue with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He'll rate to some of the best centers. And him and Shaq in their prime, who would win out. And we'll ask him that when we come back. Coming up next. You mentioned John Wooden. What, what did he teach you most that you hang on to today? I think I would not have been 
anywhere near successful as a parent if I had not played for Coach Woodley. Plus, you and Shaq, in your prime if you faced off, would, would you handle them? Who would win that? I would have made him run the court. <laughs> okay. I would have shot a lot of hook shots on him that he would not have been able to block. That's next on CMI, the Chris Myers interview. Coming up next on the Chris Myers interview, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar explains why the center position is no longer the NBA's center of attention. What, what, what happened to the big man in, in the NBA? I think the three-point shot has made all big men want to be Magic Johnson. So all the big guys now want to play point guard and have those kind of skills. Also on the way. The greatest NBA player across the board, who comes to mind first for you? Oscar Robertson. How about today's player who's, who's the best? Get the answer next on the Chris Myers interview with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You're watching CMI, the Chris Myers interview. We're back with uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, the Hall of Famer. And, uh, you know, when you think about great centers of all time, I think people usually rank Bill Russell as the great defensive center, you as the great offensive center. Wilt Chamberlain maybe is one of the best all around. H how would you rank him? It's so difficult because there are errors in the, in the game. I, I always defer to, to Wilt and, and Bill because I learned from them. And uh, I, I always kind of feel that I, I've yet to see anybody average 50 points a game. I don't think we're ever going to see that again. <laughs> so Wilt and Bill, they, they are like the, the, myth, the mythical guys in the game. You and Shaq, in your prime, if you faced off, would, would you handle them? Who would win that? I don't know. Shaq's a load. Uh, tough guy around, around the basket strength and agility that he had around the basket. Could he have very, worked on his offense more? I mean, could a hook I, shot? Of course. He didn't, yeah. he didn't have much of a shot away from the basket. Uh, four feet from the basket, he was approaching being ordinary. Um, I would have made him run the court. <laughs> okay. I would have shot a lot of hook shots on him that he would not have been able to block. But who knows? Yeah, we, you got to go out there and, and put it to test. And well, that's what's fun about sports. We get to do those kinds of things. What, what, what happened to the big man in, in the NBA and the role of, of the big man? Are there just not enough of them that want to work hard enough at it? Or has the league and the game, the style changed? I think the three-point shot has made all big men want to be Magic Johnson. They, they see somebody that's 6'9 and plays point guard. So all the big guys now want to play point guard and have those kind of skills. Uh, playing the game with your back to the basket uh, closer to the hoop doesn't have the appeal that uh, style-wise that the other parts of the game do. Well, well so, you, you mentioned John Wooden, one of the great coaches of all time, if, if not the greatest, certainly in the, in the college game. What, what did he teach you most that you hang on to today? I think I would not have been anywhere near successful as a parent if I had not played for Coach Wooden. What he taught us about challenging us, and it had to do with basketball, but he challenged us and then let us fail trying it our way up to a certain point. Okay. And then he, he, put, he put his thumb down and said, all right, now you got to do it the right way. And I, I learned something in that. And human nature is the same. So in dealing with my children, I, I had that example of a great teacher who knew how to do that. So if I've had any success as a parent, I, I have to give Coach Wooden credit. Uh, UCLA, back then you were Lou Alcindor, and, and the change and the change from religion to, to Islam. How, how old were you when you made that change, thus the name change? And, and, and if you can describe it a sentence or two so people understand you know, wh you know, how, what it took for you to make that change. Well, for me, I, I had become Muslim while I was going to UCLA, but I, I didn't change my name or anything because I didn't know if I was going to stick with that. So stick after, with religion, the religion. Stick with the religion. I, I didn't know if I wanted to publicly okay. deal with it. 
But the more I thought about it and the more I lived it, it, it seemed to make sense to me. But I, I was 24 years old when I changed my name publicly. But it had to do with me having a, a moral anchor and something to hold on to in order to live my life up, up, up to certain moral standards. Um, I had always believed in religious ideals and I wanted to carry that on through my life and Islam made the most sense to me. It wasn't a political statement though. It had nothing to do with, with, with politics for me. When 9-11 took place and Islam, Muslim religion and the reaction or misunderstanding after that in, in our country, were, were, did that affect you in, in any way? I, it's affected all Muslims. When you have a, a faction within a religion that takes its own insane political philosophy and says it's justified by the religious tenets that a, a great deal of Muslims views quite differently than these people, a whole distortion takes place. And people that don't believe in that have to uh, affirm what it's about. American Muslims had it very easy up to that point. But after 9-11, that, that, all of that changed. And we have to make an example of, of what Islam is supposed to be about. It's, it is a religion of peace. I, I always liken it to what it would be like if the Ku Klux Klan all of a sudden were the spokesmen for Christianity. And they, they have called themselves the, the Christian Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. But they're about violence and, and hatred. It, that's not what Christianity is about. W were you discriminated uh, against when, once you made that change, either in the locker room or in public? Not really. I, I think I, I was very fortunate that Muhammad Ali went before me and he dealt with all of the, the difficult aspects of it. I, I was able to, just by showing that I wasn't political to, to escape most of that. Muhammad Ali, the greatest, a real quick couple of NBA things. The greatest NBA player across the board, who comes to mind first for you? Oscar Robertson. Yeah, because at every level he was... At, at every level he was the best ever. Uh, high school, college and the pros. He's, st he's still got NC2A records. Okay. Uh, he's uh, in, a, in a class by himself, I think. How about today's player who's, who's the best? Geez, that's tough. That, that, that's, that's very tough. There's so many great players. Uh, Dwayne Wade, uh, you see him. He's, he's unbelievable. Uh, not Kobe? Co Kobe certainly. Up there. I, I, like, I like Jason Kidd. I like uh, Duncan. LeBron James, uh, too young to be... Uh, that Le category? Well, Le LeBron James has to get his leadership thing together, but as an athlete, he's, he's superb. Uh, Kevin Garnett, just steady, consistent, plays all aspects of the game. There, there are a lot of great players in the game. All right, well, we appreciate uh, your time as always. Good luck. Keep up uh, the books, uh, the authoring. We enjoy it. Thanks. My pleasure. Uh, thank you. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar with us on CMI. We thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Tune in next week when Chris sits down with the unpredictable Dennis Rodman. The former NBA wildman reveals why life after basketball has been anything but boring. The worm also explains why Michael Jordan didn't speak to him for years while they were teammates. Get the story on the next episode of CMI, the Chris Myers interview. You're watching CMI, the Chris Myers interview. We're back with uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, the Hall of Famer. And, uh, you know, when you think about great centers of all time, I think people r usually rank Bill Russell as the great defensive center, you as the great offensive center. Wilt Chamberlain maybe is one of the best all around. H how would you rank him? It's so difficult because there are errors in the, in the game. I, I always defer to, to Wilt and, and Bill because I learned from them. And uh, I, I always kind of feel that I, I've yet to see anybody average 50 points a game. I don't think we're ever going to see that again. <laughs> so Wilt and Bill, they, they are like the, the, myth, the mythical guys in the game. You and Shaq, in your prime, if you faced off, would, would you handle them? Who would win that? I don't know. Shaq's a load. Uh, tough guy around, around the basket strength and agility that he had around the basket. Could he have worked on his offense more? I mean, could a hook I, shot? Of course. He didn't, yeah. he didn't have much of a shot 
away from the basket, uh, four feet from the basket, he was approaching being ordinary. Um, I would have made him run the court. <laughs> okay. I would have shot a lot of hook shots on him that he would not have been able to block. But who knows? Yeah, we, you got to go out there and, and put it to test. And well, that's what's fun about sports. We get to do those kinds of things. What, what, what happened to the big man in, in the NBA and the role of, of the big man? Are there just not enough of them that want to work hard enough at it? Or has the league and the game the style changed? I think the three-point shot has made all big men want to be Magic Johnson. They, they see somebody that's 6'9 and plays point guard. So all the big guys now want to play point guard and have those kind of skills. Uh, playing the game with your back to the basket uh, close to, to the hoop doesn't have the appeal that uh, style-wise that the other parts of the game do. Well, well so you, you mentioned John Wooden, one of the great coaches of all time, if, if not the greatest, certainly in the, in the college game. What, what did he teach you most that you hang on to today? I think I would not have been anywhere near successful as a parent if I had not played for Coach Wooden. What he taught us about challenging us, and it had to do with basketball, but he challenged us and then let us fail trying it our way up to a certain point. Okay. And then he, he, put, he put his thumb down and said, all right, now you got to do it the right way. And I, I learned something in that. And human nature is the same. So in dealing with my children, I, I had that example of a great teacher who knew how to do that. So if I've had any success as a parent, I, I have to give Coach Wooden credit. Uh, UCLA, back then you were Lou Alcindor and, and the change and the change from religion to, to Islam. How, how old were you when you made that change, thus the name change? And, and, and if you can describe it a sentence or two so people understand you know, wh you know, how, what it took for you to make that change. Well, for me, I, I had become Muslim while I was going to UCLA, but I, I didn't change my name or anything because I didn't know if I was going to stick with that. So stick after, with religion, the religion. Stick with the religion. Okay. I, I didn't know if I wanted to publicly okay. deal with it. But the more I thought about it and the more I lived it, it, it seemed to make sense to me. But I, I was 24 years old when I changed my name publicly. But it had to do with me having a, a moral anchor and something to hold on to in order to live my life up, up, up to certain moral standards. Um, I had always believed in religious ideals and I wanted to carry that on through my life and Islam made the most sense to me. It wasn't a political statement though. It had nothing to do with, with, with politics for me. When 9-11 took place and Islam, Muslim religion and the reaction or misunderstanding after that in, in our country, were, were, did that affect you in, in any way? I, it's affected all Muslims. When you have a, a faction within a religion that takes its own insane political philosophy and says it's justified by the religious tenets that a, a great deal of Muslims views quite differently than these people, a whole distortion takes place. And people that don't believe in that have to uh, affirm what it's about. American Muslims had it very easy up to that point. But after 9-11, that, that, all of that changed. And we have to make an example of, of what Islam is supposed to be about. It's, it is a religion of peace. I, I always liken it to what it would be like if the Ku Klux Klan all of a sudden were the spokesmen for Christianity. And they, they have called themselves the, the Christian Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. But they're about violence and, and hatred. It, that's not what Christianity is about. W were you discriminated uh, against when, once you made that change, either in the locker room or in public? Not really. I, I think I, I was very fortunate that Muhammad Ali went before me and he dealt with all of the, the difficult aspects of it. I, I was able to, just by showing that I wasn't political to, to escape most of that. Muhammad Ali, the greatest. A real quick couple of NBA things. The greatest NBA player across the board. Who comes to mind first for you? Oscar Robertson. Yeah, because at every level he was... At, at every level he was the best ever. Uh, high school, college and the pros. He's, st he's still got NC2A records. Okay. Uh, he's uh, in, a, in a class by himself, I think. How about today's player who's, who's the best? Geez, that's tough. That, that, that's, that's very tough. There's so many great players. Uh, Dwayne Wade, uh, you see him. He's, he's unbelievable. Uh, not Kobe? 
Uh, Col Colby certainly. Up there. I, I like I like Jason Kidd. I like uh, Duncan. LeBron James, uh, too young to be in um, that Le category. Well, Le LeBron James has to get his leadership thing together, but as an athlete, he's he's superb. Uh, Kevin Garnett, just steady, consistent, plays all aspects of the game. There, there are a lot of great players in the game. All right, well, we appreciate uh, your time as always. Good luck. Keep up uh, the books, uh, the authoring. We enjoy it. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank right. you. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar with us on CMI. We thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Take care. To see bonus footage of this interview, log on to foxsports.com on MSN. That's where you'll find streaming video from past interviews and previews of upcoming guests. It's only...